Really? Yeah. A white, okay. All right, that's fair. All right, so we are live now, Hannah. Um, just real quick before we begin, I wanted to tell everyone I have Hannah Mead on here today. Did I say that last name right? Close Shame enough. on me. <laughs> I'm, I'm with a slow reading group, if you can't tell. But we have Hannah here, guys. She's a marine biologist. She's worked you know, with, with cooperatively with land-based anglers and also with enforcement, making new laws about land-based shark fishing. So Hannah, how are you? Good. I'm very good. Thanks so much for having me on. Yes, ma'am. Have yeah, definitely appreciate it. Now I'm just gonna I'm gonna dig in real quick. Obviously, we we have eleven questions to go over, and I really appreciate your time. But the first thing I want to talk about is tail roping, right? I want to talk about tail roping because I have had the maybe the wrong impression on tail roping. Um, you know, can you can you explain is tail roping a protected fish, a prohibited act for an angler? Um, I mean. It from my understanding from the FWC, mostly work here in Florida, um, it is not considered um, a, a bad practice. It is part of, I believe, the the recommended gear that's supposed to have, an angler is supposed to have with them. Um, in all of my experience with research, uh, we've always put a tail rope on the animal to help control it when you're handling it. Um, just kind of makes sense, but I can understand maybe from, it depends on the very specific rules. So yeah, yeah, if it's yeah, really yeah. like indicating that you are um, capturing it, um, you know, it just, it depends on how it's interpreted. But here in Florida, um, that's, that doesn't seem to be the case. I'm really glad that we're, and we're covering that first because it, what I've been told from some anglers in the panhandle, specifically in Florida, is that they, F, FWC will interpret that as actually capturing the fish and it's a huge no-no. But I'm a firm believer on, putting a tail rope in a good angler's hands for the practices of release will actually keep the angler safe and keep the fish safe because it allows us to work more quickly. Would you agree with that? Um, yeah, again, from our experience, um, we've done most of our research is boat based. So a tail rope is absolutely critical to getting the shark like alongside the boat and just manage to get, you know, capture the data and get all of the samples that we need. Um, so yes, uh, I mean, I think it's looking at the rules of, um, you know, you are able to target prohibited species and you are able to like land them, but there's very specific like definitions of those words. Uh, so I can't, you know, I can't see where yeah. I would be interested to learn more about what that interpretation is um, because you are able to catch and land them. You Hannah, are you there? harvest them okay I, I just lost you temporarily oh. um you basically said uh, yeah something broke with a signal it's okay can you say that last part again please just that the definition of a prohibited species is like a hammerhead is prohibited from harvest right so that means you know taking it and you know killing it and keeping it and like removing it from the population is harvesting it I, um so i'm, I'm, I'm really blown away right now. I'm so glad because honestly, I, the last trip I was on, I didn't use a tail rope and we were getting beat up and destroyed in that shore break. And, and, and I, I, we cut, we cut the leader a few times and it had, we had a tail rope to move the fish up a little bit. Anyways, it, it would have been a different story, but let's go into you now. So can you tell us how long have you been a marine biologist? Um, I will see. I, I want to say 14 years, but that makes me feel really old. So, um, <laughs> yeah, about almost 14 years, um, finished my master's degree at the university of Cape town in South Africa. And that's where I feel like I kind of stepped into the career. Awesome. Awesome. Now another question, how long, and, and I think that the reason I wanted you to talk to us is because you have one of the, you know, special, you're kind of special in that you have experience in working with FWC and cooperatively with land-based shark anglers. So can you tell us a little bit about how long you've been actually working with, uh, cooperatively working with land-based shark anglers? Yeah, we we started the project in, I think like April of 2018. Um, didn't really kick off because we were focused on hammerheads and the season really didn't start until that fall. Uh, so we made a little bit of an effort on the West Coast um, in 2018 in April and then really kicked it off um, in October of 2018. 
um, working with over 60 plus anglers, um, all kind of all over the state, back and forth on the East and West coast. So about almost four years, it'll be four years this year. Is that right? Yeah, no, it's crazy. <laughs> I'm so glad that you're a part of it, Hannah. I absolutely love your, your style of angling. I love your, well, not angling. Well, <laughs> eh, but I love your style of, of research and, and being cooperative with, it. I mean, we've bled together. Yeah. You and I yeah. have bled together. You've, yep. you've seen anyways, we're, we'll just keep it at that. Now <laughs> here's, here's a question and you, you have to understand you know, what we're trying to do here is we're trying, we're trying to educate and, and we're trying to be transparent. So I know you, you got to be by the book and, and that's what I want. I want, but I also want your opinion. Okay. This mm -hmm. next question, maybe a little bit more by the book, but what does Florida say exactly about handling a protected fish? So I, I will have to double check on the language and I would encourage everybody um, to get your eyes on the actual language that is used um because i think that's really important i think there's a lot of like not misinformation but i think there's a lot of like you know lang the language is very when it comes to policy language is very important so the words that you use like prohibited versus protected yeah yeah um yeah. things like that are really specific when it comes to policy and so i definitely encourage everyone um, to get their hands on the actual law um, and the codes. And we'll have a link on our website for that, for sure. Um, and basically it's, you know, it, it's the language is saying that you should keep the, the that you have to keep a prohibited species um, gill submerged in water. And what, now, now here's the thing. What is that? What do you mean submerged? Fully submerged? Partially submerged? I will more. have to see. I the original draft that I saw, which I, I was a, a while ago, was partially submerged. Um, it may say fully submerged, but let's talk about what actually happens in a yeah. shore break when you're handling these animals. There's times when the waves are in, they're out. The waves can be big. It can be breaking right there on the shore. And so even if you're waist deep with an animal, that could be dangerous for an angler. Yeah. Um, so, you know, one or two lines below that, um, you know, for practical reasons, they did have to include a statement that, you know, nothing supersedes angler safety. So there are times when a prohibited species may need to be pulled a little bit further. And so it's not constantly submerged. The gills aren't constantly submerged because right there you've got two to three foot, you know, waves breaking on you and people can really get hurt. So that last line can be interpreted several different ways as anything can. Um, so angler safety can, t you know, can, may supersede some of it. Um, but I think we all know the intention behind it is yeah. like, listen, they're prohibited for, a, they're, you know, prohibited from harvest for a reason. And everyone should by default be trying to keep their gills in the water at all the times. Yeah. But, but I really like, it's dangerous to say this, but I really like the fact that the angler safety should, and you know, this is dangerous because of, anyways, but the, that angler angler safety comes first. Right. And I think there's some people that could take advantage of that, unfortunately. Uh, and that won't be good for us, but you know, dude, this is dangerous. Right. And we could be thrown into a, you know, a 700 pound animal, right. Not to mention the teeth and, and these other things. So, I mean, it is dangerous. So I really like that we're covering the tail rope and I really like how you mentioned that f for the most part, it's more about intention, right? It's about safety and it's about intention. And as long as you're intending to release quickly, you're intending to get it back and you're not, um, you, you know, you're not working on the animal to take pictures and video per se. I think that's really what they're looking for. Right. Yeah, I mean, listen, you can't, the, the perfect regulation doesn't exist. And the FWC had an incredibly difficult job to say, like, listen, we know you want to be out here fishing and we understand that, you know, you have the right to do that. But we also have to respect the fact that these animals are susceptible from dying after release, like a big long fight time yeah. of a big hammer, like they just, they stress out very easily. So it's like trying to write regulations. You do need some buy-in from the anglers. Like we do need the community to say like, okay, you know, we get it. We also want to catch the shark again. Um, so if you're like by the book and word by word, you know, that's where you can get into like interpretation, but like yeah. really, you know, the intention is like, you want to catch this animal again. So, yeah. you know, 
probably best to keep its gills in the water. <laughs> Definitely. So, and it kind, of, it kind of leads me to the next question. And I know you have a study coming out. Like I said, I don't, I, I don't want to give people, you know, it takes a long time to write these things up. You've done a lot of research. Okay. But let me push you against the corner a little bit here. It's the season. Okay. It's kind of the season right now. And we don't want things washing up. That's going to hurt us all. Even the people fishing in the shadows, even the OGs per se, they don't want this to happen, right? Whether they're in the public eye or not. So can you share some tips with us, you know, on the best way to successfully release a hammerhead and, and can you give us as many details as you feel comfortable with on that from a scientific and keep in mind from a scientific perspective here right yeah and, and you would know more than the normal person yeah i mean we this is the first ever study on these species so it's you know we really do actually have the only data that exists um about it and we were really lucky um, in the fact that, you know, we got great participation. So we were able to put 13 tags out um, and we've had a very low mortality rate. Um, so low, so like that it's the lowest in, of all the published studies out there, this is the fishery where it's the lowest currently. Um, we're, you know, gonna focus on boat based at some point. Um, so it's good. That's good news, right? We yeah. want to have, um, we, we all want that. Like we're all, that's the goal for everybody. Um, but we did realize, I mean, I didn't know anything about fishing when I got into this, yeah. really not about this kind of fishing. It's so specific. We didn't realize we were working with, um, you know, what we have considered like some of the most experienced with the heavier gear, um, the bigger reels, you know, and, and the experience to know maybe when you should or shouldn't launch a kayak, you know, just people who I think have a lot of experience under their belt and, and the right equipment. So, you know, from what we've seen, you know, the, having the, the best gear, the heavy gear, the bigger rods the, or the bigger reels that can reduce that. The whole aim is to reduce that bite time. Yeah. Those certainly reduce that, that handling time. Um, those are really key. Having a, you know, most of the guys that we work with have a plan in place. They've got the bolt cutters there, the tail ropes ready. You know, everybody knows what they're doing. You know, they've all been assigned a task. Um, and we, so those are the kinds of like characteristics that we've seen that has resulted in very low mortality. And I think it's important to note, and, and you know, we'll get into the online presence of land-based shark fishing and the harm that's doing uh, to us. But some people get upset, you know, they, they, they fish, you know, reels like senators and, you know, people try to educate them and, and, and we're not coming at them from a bully type of standpoint. It's just the fact is, is you need the proper gear if you're going to successfully land hammerheads, right? And no, I'm sorry, successfully release the hammerheads. So, you know, and you, you, I think you just agreed with this. The fight time is important and the handling time is important. Can you go into maybe, and I give us an idea of a recommended, and I know this is impossible to do. Okay. A recommended, I'm just being honest, a recommended fight time, you know, when, when it, you know, what's a recommended fight time and what's a recommended handling time? So, I, I mean, I, I, I don't have enough data to give any kind of like hard recommendations. Like it, we haven't been able to run statistics on this, even though we've had, 13, you know, 16 fish actually, but 13 like tags that have reported. Um, but I can say of those, like the average fight time, um, you know, the average length of the, so first of all, we're talking about an average length of like th 300, so about over three meters. So over 12, you know, that's our average. Um, Not bad. No. Well, I mean, you know, again, like it, I didn't know that that was people were that, <laughs> that excited about it. Um, but our fight times were averaging at 24 minutes. Um, mm, the max wow. was 51 and the fastest was a little shark that came in at seven minutes. So um, wow. phenomenal, but, but a really big, um, thing that we think probably is key is also that handling time. Yeah. So we record that as soon as, an angler actually gets control of the shark in, you know, whether it, whether they're chest deep or whether it's on the set, you know, wherever it is, that's, you know, the, when they first put their hands on it. And to on the leader is it, so uh, what, uh, what, and I'm sorry to interrupt you, but at what point do you consider it handling when they grab the leader or when the fish hits the sand? It's when the, when a human touches the shark. 
Okay. So that's handling time. Okay. So like if they're still, if you're handling the leader and they're still able, like if they're a trough or something and they can swim back and forth, that's in their own volition. Um, when you actually get a angler's hands on the animal, that's from that point until when they release, like when the last time they push it off and let go of that shark, that's considered handling time. So obviously it's fair to say that the handling time is as if not more important than the actual fighting time of the fish. Like we're still not able to like definitively say that. Um, but I will say though, you know, of the ones of mortalities that we've had, we did notice that the handling time was significantly higher, um, two to three times higher than, than the handling times of the ones that survived. Um, again, that's not been like run through statistics. Yeah, no, right. Um, it's not like a hard and fast rule, but it was definitely a, it was something we noticed, um, right away. I'm excited to see the report, but I'm still going to yeah. ask this question. Okay. Can you give us an idea of, a you know, of it, it, the answer should be as soon as possible. I know that. Right. But can you give us a, a kind of a roundabout av average of the successful releases and the handling time? And, and here's why, I mean, some fish are 200 pounds, some fish are 800 pounds. Oh yeah. Right. But can you give us an idea just, just because, you know, I mean, I really, I really think it's important. I mean, well, this is the crazy thing. We had fight times from seven to 51 minutes. Um, the 51 minute one lived. Uh, so it wasn't that it was like, oh, that super long time, they're definitely going to die. But I would also say that like what contributed to a 51 minute fight time was the experience of the angler and the gear. So if the majority of the guys out there are, you know, fishing on something a lot lighter, I can only assume that fight time is going to be a lot longer. And especially if you let the real run, you know, to get that cool noise of a real running, you know, sometimes that's again, like you're letting out another couple hundred yards. Um, that's adding a lot of time to your fight time. So of the people we worked with, like we can definitely say that they were well under an hour. Um, but, you know, again, if you go online and you see some of the discussions, like, there are longer fight times um, and yeah. there's certainly longer handling times. Um, so I can just say from our study, like super comfortable for handling specifically Yeah, um, that, you know, it was under, it was one to two minutes for a lot of the handling. Good. Just super fast. I will be, yeah. you know, I know that that's really fast. <laughs> no, I've, I've, I've been out there with you. I've been in danger to just try to just to try to increase that handling time. But I am really impressed by, you know, an average fish size of over 12 foot, the handling, I mean, I'm sorry, the fight time being 24 minutes that you're working with some of the best. Um, let me move on here now. And, and, and this is important, right? This is important. And I know we're walking into maybe a trap here, but <laughs> what, what should an angler do if a protected fish dies? Yeah, that is, that is, um, that's also hard to navigate. <laughs> um, I understand I've, I've heard, you know, like I'm sure you have, I've heard people talk about, you know, having spoken to a sheriff or FWC or, you know, mm -hmm. lots of different sources have told people a lot of different things. Um, firstly, I'd love to let you guys know that we're working on a, the program with FWC to be, to, to respond to calls like that. Um, so the American Shark want, Conservancy is? Yeah. So the American Shark Conservancy is partnering with FWC to kind of create a program that like, if that should happen, um, you call us, you let us know, and we really want to get the sample. So we're coming at it from a scientific point of view. Yeah, like we yeah. don't want that chart. We don't want that information to get lost. Uh, so a lot of the times, you know, if it's the next day, city official, that animal is just going to go to the dump and all of that information is going to get wasted. Um, so I've heard through the grapevine that there's been some other suggestions, like definitely cut it up, definitely dump it back at the sea. Um, sometimes they say to bury it. I don't know what the actual rules are to be completely honest with you. And as we move forward, developing this program, like I will definitely get clarity on that because it does seem to be a point of confusion. Uh, I can understand not wanting it to be on the beach the next day. That doesn't look good for anyone. Um, so I understand that, but exactly what the legal route is, you absolutely cannot have, if it's a prohibited species, don't take home the jaws, don't take home the fins. Um, you cannot have those in your possession. Like that is for sure clear. 
but what to, how to actually dispose of it, um, yeah. that definitely needs some clarity. So, so they should probably contact FWC and get instructions. And from your, yeah. from what you know, you know, is FWC hard on anglers that accidentally kill a fish? I mean, you know, it probably depends on who you talk to. Uh, however, I will say among the fishery managers from the state and federal level, there is an acceptance that mortalities happen. Um, you know, there it is unavoidable. It's nature. Uh, it can happen. What I would say is that I don't know if they would necessarily be hard on an angler, but that angler better be sure, you know, just make sure that you've got the right gear, you have your license, you have your permit to shore base shark fish, um, have the gear you're supposed to have, you know, if your chip is tight, you know, if you've got your stuff together, then there really shouldn't be any like hard ramification you know like it's, yeah. it it shouldn't be something that you get into a lot of trouble for um or trouble at all depending on the circumstances just as long as you're kind of following the rules um mortalities happen uh but again like i would i would call the fwc i would call the fish kill hotline yeah. um i would contact us and um yeah it, it definitely is part of it's part of the fishing process now, if I could be so bold, and I know you're not used to that for me, um, if see, you know, because you got to understand, and, and I think, I think this is known people are scared of enforcement, right? People sure. mostly don't want to acknowledge a mistake. So a lot, a lot of people are accountable. Some people aren't. So I'm going to go ahead and say, and I'm going to ask you this. Can we suggest that if someone loses a protected fish, or, you know, protected fish, a, what was the other term? I can't, I can't even, I've, I have, I've had COVID. Yeah, I've been in bed for, this is my first time back in over 30 days. I'm, you're COVID doing got it. me bad. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Anyways, um, can we suggest that they contact you? I mean, absolutely. I, I already have, you know, a, a handful of people that do reach out if anything should happen. Um, and I can, you know, it, everything stays anonymous. Um, you know, nothing okay. needs, we don't share information. That's part of our program moving forward is assuring people that, you know, this isn't going to go on any kind of like black on for any individuals. Yeah. So no. I, I just want to reiterate this and I want to show them how to contact you. So what Hannah's saying is reach out to her, right? It's better to reach out to someone, reach out to her. If a fish dies, she can help guide you. It's anonymous. So I'm going to bring her website up real quick. Okay. This is her website. Okay. It's American shark conservancy.org. When you go here, you go to contacts. Okay. There is a form that you can fill out, put your email, put your phone over and put the message and send that to her. Okay. If, 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 it, if you don't want to contact FWC, you contact Hannah, but also they can reach you through Facebook. Is that right? Yeah. I'm, honestly, any of the social media channels, um, we're not on Snapchat, but we're definitely on Twitter and Instagram. Are you on TikTok? Facebook. We have a TikTok. Look, look <laughs> my interns are way younger and cooler than me. And so we do have a TikTok. I don't know how it works or anything about it. Um, so you might not get a response if you go to TikTok. But it does exist, I think. So, and again, just to reiterate, you guys, if you lose a protected fish, at the very least, go to her Facebook page, American Shark Conservancy, and message her. All right. Hannah wants the data. She wants to help you. What we do not want are huge fish washing up. Is that fair to say, Hannah? Do we want that? I mean, look, I don't. Yeah. Well, maybe you do. That's not a fair question. You no. want that. <laughs> <I'm out. Right? laughs> no, I definitely don't. I definitely don't want to see that happen. Um, but I don't want to see it get wasted either. And I just don't want it to, you know, I don't want it to turn. I want the right information out there. So as long as I can get the information directly from FWC, exactly how they want, you know, obviously this just pertains to Florida, um, you know, exactly what the messaging should be. I know that that's a point of confusion. So if we can help get the message out there of like what you're supposed to do, you know, how the FWC is going to react, um, then I'd be happy, you know, like we want to make sure that the right information is getting out there. And just to, you know, anyone that's listening, just, just to reassure you, I've been you know, working with Hannah for what, three years, three years or more. And I could certainly reassure you that, you know, 
she, she's got good intentions. She's got good intentions. She wants things to improve. She wants things to get better. So, so definitely reach out to her. And can you just confirm that we did see a comet fall out of the sky? Listen, I, yeah, no, I was doing <laughs> some stuff on the beach and you and I are the only ones. I'm sure it was an alien. I know it was. I, I know it was an alien I ship. I know. Okay? I know that. Yeah. <laughs> I can't believe no one else saw it. No one else was paying attention. The whole Everyone sky. Anyways, we won't go there. It was green. Yeah, it was amazing. It was so, now here's a dicey question, but I think we really got to talk about this. Um, you know, there's different groups in land-based shark fishing. And my premise is, is, is the online presence of land-based shark fishing is really destroying us, right? It's destroying us in so, in, in so many ways, but you know, you, you're, you've seen the online presence. You've seen the actual anglers, right? A lot of them are keyboard warriors, whatever, you know, it's, you kind of laugh it off, but I, you know, can you give us your overall opinion of land-based shark fishing, the anglers and you know, what it's like to meet them <laughs> and then and yeah. the, and the online presence? And, and I mean, I don't know if anyone cares what my opinion is, but I will say that I have come up against a lot of pushback when talking about this fishery in like, you know, federal meetings and state meetings, um, the overall, like for people who have not actually been out there um, that are looking in from the outside, it's all coming from what's like visible online. So none of these other researchers or policymakers have really been out there. So it's not a, it's not a great reputation. <laughs> so that's the only like I'm not in any forums. I'm not on any groups. Um, I don't really know, you know, too much about what's going on. I, you know, sometimes I people share information with me. Um, it, but it, it's always struck me as odd that people have such, you know, who from the outside have such like a negative um, idea about the reputation. And because my personal experience has been face to face you know, the 60 plus anglers that I've met along the way um, have been really gracious um, just to allow a complete stranger to come up and talk to you about science yeah. and conservation and, you know, allow me to tag your animal, like allow me to ask questions about a million questions about reels because I still don't quite understand how drag, I don't know. Um, but, you oh know, my like, God, really? After... Listen, right. you better hope Dan doesn't hear this, but I should, keep going. <laughs> so bad. Um, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I've had nothing. Knock on wood. I mean, I, I, I've had nothing but good experiences, and like we sent out, you know, a survey to everyone who signed up for a shore-based um, shark fishing permit in Florida. So there's over a thousand anglers, over like fourteen thousand anglers. We heard back from about eight hundred. Um, 800 of those, you know, all of those basically said like, yes, we're interested in science. Yes. Yeah. We're interested in learning more about best practices. Like, yes, we'd love to help you tag. We want to, you know, keep in touch. We want updates. And that to me is like such a contradiction to what I think from what I hear is portrayed online. Um, so it is kind of a weird, you know, it's, it's a juxtaposition. Um, it just doesn't, it doesn't seem like what I know in person matches up with some of the things that seem to happen online. But like I said, I'm not in any of the forums or groups or anything. So I don't know a hundred percent. And, and you know what? That's, that amazes me. Even though you're not in these groups, you hear about them all the time because you're going to these meetings and they're th essentially throwing it in your face. <laughs> right. Like, you know, these guys are, but you know what? I think the reality is Hannah, I think most of the anglers are good people. The men and the women are great people. They're, you know, fathers, mothers, husbands, wives, and they want to have a good time, you know, with their family. And they, they want to be part of something that they feel, and I feel as well, that's, that's a thrill. I really believe it's a very, very small amount of people that are really ruining this for us all. And I think, and you kind of hit the nail on the head, I think it really, especially online, I think it's disgusting. You know, we're, you know, on on the page that me and some other admins um, are, are trying to run, it's land based shark fishing. You know, we're really trying and have tried to clean it up. And I got to tell you, it's cost me a lot of money, right? S stressed me out, <laughs> right? But I love it. And to me, it's important that, you know, like what you just said, the people that I know, the people that I fish with are great people and their work ethic, right? They're working. 
my God. We, right? literally, like, we literally brought researchers in from Canada and um, they were here for like a week. And basically they work with freshwater um, anglers in Canada, um, had never seen anything like this. And they were just like completely blown away about yeah. the dedication you know, up early, like pulling the gear out, cleaning the gear, wrapping it, you know, just kayaking out and kayaking out and kayaking, you know, like they were just like blown yeah. away by <laughs> the amount of effort that goes into this. It's and brutal. So it's just, it's a, it's a, it's a huge undertaking really for those who are passionate about it. Um, and honestly, and, and I, that's what I, that's really what I, I, I want to push. I want to push what really goes on. And it's not on these, you know, it's not on a lot of these internet forums. That's not the reality of, you know, all this arguing, all of these shaming and bashing. That's not the people that I know, but it has such a large impact because, again, a small amount of wackos, if you will, had success in catching some fish. They know how to manipulate people very easily. And it is what it is. But, you know, moving on. Thank you for being honest as you could. I wish I had the recorded version of what you really said, but we'll, we'll go no. on. <laughs> no, I wasn't oh recorded. God. But anyways, now here's a good question. OK. And again, I think you have a special perspective being that, you know, angler side, you know, enforcement side, you know, science side. Right. All three sides there. Um, in your eyes, you know, what's the best way to preserve and protect the sport of land based shark fishing? Um, I mean, I think from our point of view, like you said, we've, we've dealt with policymakers. I've seen it from, you know, we've listened to and talked to all aspects of it. So I know the policymakers are, they're trying really hard to come up with like enforceable laws and rules that are going to like protect the animals, but still allow the fishery to be, oh, it's a very tough, like that's super hard. Yeah. Um, you know, the anglers themselves are like, we're kind of misrepresented. People have the wrong idea about our fishery. Like not all the sharks are dying, but that's, so they feel miss, you know, it seems to me like they tell us that they feel a little miss, you know, misrepresented um, and misunderstood. And then from the science side, like we're comfortable in our little bubble and saying like, okay, well, we're going to, we're going to just stick with the numbers. Um, that's where I'm comfortable talking yeah. about this stuff. I know, you know, like that's, I, that's what I'm a scientist. Like that's, that's what I understand. And so, you know, we have, let's talk about the, I want the human being in you bring it out. Yeah, no. And this is the thing is that like <laughs> the human being in me can comfortably talk about low mortality rates. And so I can say the anglers that we worked with had these things in common that resulted in this good result. So I can easily say, you know, if you're new to the sport, maybe you should, you know, touch base with somebody who's been doing it a bit longer, um, fish with them for a while. You know, if you need to upgrade a reel, maybe upgrade to a heavier reel. I mean, all of ours were, you know, 130s or um, the Everall, Am I gonna say it wrong? 16? No, there is no 16. There's an 18 or 14. We okay. get it. Are you okay? You know it. what I mean? Big so, old reels with a lot of drag. <laughs> yeah. And like, you know, these are the things that I can comfortably say, like, because we got this low mortality number, um, you know, these are the things that everybody can consider. And like, I think the top down has has already happened. So that the FWC and the managers have put into place what they can. Um, and now it's going to have to be kind of the, what we talk about being bottom up. So it's everybody talking respectfully. Um, no, you know, no. When you say everyone, you're talking about the anglers. Is that right? Yeah. So from the, you know, the top down being the regular. Uh oh, I think I'm lost a connection with you a little bit. You are in it's mid. Down. Okay. Now, oh, I got you now. Okay. Say that again. Well, when we're talking about the FWC, we're talking about top down. So they put the pressure on by creating rules and regulations and, you know, they'll come down with the enforcement if needed. But what's really important as well to fill those gaps then is the bottom up. So that's working yeah. with the community and the community together agreeing like best practices gets us to where we all want to be, which means you know, more hammerheads survive, more angling, you know, the future for the fishery. Um, so, you know, for it moving forward is just educate yourself on the, or, you know, local ordinances, read the FWC law, ask an enforcement officer if you have questions. Um, 
and just being, I think like respectfully following the rules as they are. And then, you know, if you're more of an experienced angler, like offering up, it might be a little tricky with egos and stuff, but like offering up, you know, solid advice. And that's where our, like our science, like you can point to it and say like every single one of these 13 animals, you know, survived because they, you can see the class of reel. Um, you can see the type of rod uh, you can, which, which resulted in these fight times. So recommendations can be made, but I think it's really going to be that bottom up, like everybody as a community agreeing, like best practices are, are the way to go. You know, so much you brought out just then. I don't even know what to, I have no, you, you <laughs> left me speechless, but I mean, I think what you're saying is we got to come together as a community, quite frankly, all, you know, the division. And again, I don't think, I think it's a small group of people, right. But I think what, you know, what you're really saying is you got to help. You got to educate. If you've learned a certain skill, you have to teach the other. And to me, that's a big deal. I told you how much money and sleep I've lost over this, but to me, it's a big deal because for, and I, and you know, this, you know, up until about a year and a half ago, I pretty much stayed off social media. I didn't want to help people. I was doing my own thing, fishing on an Island and I was having the best time of my life. I don't like the attention. I don't like the attention. Right. But I came back because, you know, at the time I felt that the misinformation, right. The bullying, the suppressing of knowledge was taking over. And that is the only reason that, that I came back. I wanted to help breed some, some new leaders because I can't do this much longer. Right. I don't, I, I don't, I don't have it in me. I, I want to have fun. Right. But we got to hold people accountable. And in one way, in, in, in my eyes, to, to hold people accountable is, is education, right? It's, it's the education part. I, I think that's so, I think, but, but the thing is, it's also, like you said, it's tricky because we, we worked hard. I worked hard. A lot of people that are experienced worked hard to get where they're at. We, you know, when I first started, I had the Texas handbook. It, it was, it sent me to Home Depot to buy a weed whacker. All right. That's where I'm coming from using J hooks. And, and so it's hard because we got hurt. We you know, spent a lot of money, went through a lot of pain to get where we're at. But I really feel like if, especially the, the experienced people, some of the people you work with, we got to come out the shadows. Well, we and come I, out the shadows. I would say like, just to push back a little bit is throwing back to my comment about the actual angling that's going on. Um, the ones that we see isn't what's really reflected. So I don't, again, I'm not in the forum, so I don't know, like, but I think that you fishing with the best in the world. Yeah. Well, I, I think <laughs> that, and that's what I'm saying. Like, but I've also met, like I, like I said, I've shook hands with more than 60 anglers. Like, so yeah, it's different yeah. groups. There are core yeah. people that I've worked with, which has been great. And it introduced me to a whole bunch of other people. Um, but what I would just say too, is that like, sometimes the stuff online isn't exactly how it's playing out in reality. And like, we would love to contribute to a best practices handbook. We would love to contribute mm -hmm. our data and like keeping it like these are just, and, and, and up for interpretation for each angler, but like, these are the facts, like these yeah. are the, you know, these are the data that led to a low mortality. And sometimes like, that's that's what we can contribute but i mean as a community yes it's up to you guys to decide to follow those best practices promote them um talk about them i mean we're super obviously open to feedback 100 percent um the project is ongoing you know so it's it's not like oh we're the, the sharks are tagged and we're done um yeah. But I think just like the more like data, the more information, it makes the arguments for best practices a little bit easier because you can say, well, this just led to this. So that, yeah. that might be the best way. In other words, there's some bad comments out there and they don't know what they're talking about. So I, I, I think that's the way you said that. I'm, you know, sure. you said there's some sure. weak answers out there. But, but no, seriously, that's why I also think the transparency is key. Because people need to learn from other people's mistakes and mistakes don't make them bad anglers. It makes right. them normal. Right? right. So, so I think, I think education along with, along with the transparency, accepting you're not perfect. I'm not perfect. You already know that. Right. I think it's all important. Why you gotta be all right and sh all cocky about it. But, <laughs> but, <laughs> but listen, you know, and I want to, you know, we've been talking about 40 minutes. Um, here, here's another question and we're going to wrap it up. 
you know, what's your interpretation now? And I wish we could be more transparent about the actual damage of the online presence of land-based shark fishing and how much damage that is doing and continues to do. I wish we could be more transparent, but that's all right. Um, you know, here, here's the thing. In my eyes, there's different levels of public reaction, right? And a lot of the enforcement, a lot of the laws are based off of certain public reaction. So when people are posting, you know, pictures of protected fish, um, you know, like sandbars or duskies, in my eyes, that's going to have a low impact uh, on the public. But when people are posting pictures of like federally protected fish, like, like sawfish, white sharks, manta rays even, um, it, it causes quite a large reaction from time to time. So can you reflect on, you know, whether or not that's a bad idea? And I know it, it has to do with intention, right? Yeah. But can you tell us, is it a good idea to post a sawfish picture with you hanging on to it? Is that a good idea, Hannah? Some people don't know, okay? Believe I, it or not. I love the positions you're putting me in. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> listen, I, I just, again, it's it's accepting the, the, the consequence. And you, you just undoubtedly from the outside, if I if if someone from shore based angling posts specifically it, for example in the past a manta ray or a sawfish the number of screenshots that i get you know if it's yeah. if it's in a secret forum or facebook you know closed group i don't see it but i get if it's on on can Instagram, can, like, can we cover and i don't mean to interrupt you but it's fair to say that the regulators and enforcement are watching all of these forums is that is that fair to say um I have no, I don't have proof of that. Um, I would say that there are people probably within them because I get screenshots and I, from people who, you know, are either members or, or truly anglers. But when the concern comes is so high that they reach out to me um, and they say, what can we do about this? What, you know, what do we do that? That's a level I don't, no one, no one, well, that's not true. Some people do send me sandbar. Um, so political but, you are right now. What? I said you're being so political. I, I love it. I <laughs> mean, my job as a scientist is <laughs> neutral. So I'm trying, I'm trying to, sh to share the fact that like, if it gets to the point where people are sending me um, screenshots, then you've started to get attention that's probably going to cause a like there's going to be a consequence for that so whether it's someone sends it to a regulator some or enforcement um you know nasty comments like whatever but that's that's when it's been elevated usually to a level and that's when it's a ham not a hammerhead but you know that's when it is especially like a manta ray or sawfish like those are animals that are going to get a lot of attention. Um, and then you have to deal with the consequences. I mean, that's, I, you know, that's something that each person has to make that decision. And I, for it to get to me, it, it means that it's probably gotten to a lot of other um, people. All right. So political and scientific. I love it. You know, you may be surprised to learn, you've probably seen the pictures that there are actually some forums that their banner is a sawfish completely disgusting and here's why not only is it stupid and wacko it's showing other anglers that may be new right maybe a year or two years and maybe they're easily gullible that you can get away with it if done correctly and that's a huge a huge problem that's not good for well, us I mean, that's not good for us as a community there's a question of like if you I get excited when I like it was scuba diving. Like I get really excited if I saw a sawfish, like that would be amazing. Um, so even divers, there's, there are suggested like behaviors in place, like don't chase it. Um, don't get in its way. Like if it wants to swim off, let it, like there are certain things that even divers that don't even touch the animal, like we caution them against doing, you know, and, and the people who study these animals and, and are working really hard to protect them, they are those are like the recommendations like please don't stress these animals out so it's it's different when it's like i got a sawfish tangled in my line i've cut the line yeah you know yeah, i'm yeah. not making judgment yeah. because like yeah. i said no, I'm, uh, yeah. i get as excited to see it so i can understand the excitement behind it um but if you do take it a step further you're you're gonna get attention for it without a doubt for sure 
I, you know, I, I, there's so much going behind the scenes that's going on. And I'm not talking, well, yes, with the anglers, but I'm talking about lawmakers, enforcement, NOAA, all, all of these people, they know what's going on. Yeah. The, the, I feel like, you know, again, a small group of people, not a lot. They're burning us from the inside. They're burning it down, Hannah. Stop. But anyways, we won't go there. <laughs> Hannah, I just want to say how much I, I appreciate you working with us as anglers, how patient you've been and I'll, and for coming on here. Can you, can you, here's the thing. You work for a nonprofit. Okay. We need people to donate to the American shark conservancy. Spartan tackle donates 10%. Sorry, Zach, 10% of our gross profits. You're going to get a payment. Okay. It's not the end of January yet to Hannah, to American shark conservancy group. So Hannah, can you please, I'm going to bring your website up here. Can you tell us how, um, no, no, you guys, this is American shark conservancy.org. It's on my website. It's very easy to find at the very least go to their Facebook page and like it. If you need help, especially with protected fish, but don't leave Hannah and her team hanging. Can you tell us how to donate to Hannah? Um, yeah, it, it should be quite easy by clicking that donate button on the top. We try to make it as, <laughs> as obvious as possible. Shoot you right over to PayPal and luckily PayPal's giving fund, um, doesn't charge any fees, which is awesome. Um, you can do reoccurring monthly payments. Um, you know, we are a very small team. We run on, you know, a shoestring budget, but I am super grateful for the, the support we've gotten. Um, a lot of anglers have reached out. It's really, really appreciated. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's, and, and just really grateful for people letting us come and talk to them about their catches and, fishing and I've, we've learned so much and we just really want to all like help us get to that same goal of allowing these animals to, to exist and, um, you know, keeping up that, that project and getting those, those data out to the policymakers. Yeah. Yeah. I get it. And I want to see more stuff on your website. You know, we'll push more people to your website. We, we need yeah. to put, we need to put, you know, there's a lot, I'm going to tell you this right now. Okay. <laughs> there's a lo there's a lot of new people, this, the, especially with these RC devices. There's a lot of new people, and we in in you know, th and there's a handful of us as well that is is trying to help everyone, right? We're trying to help, but it is exhausting, and we cannot do it alone, and we cannot last forever. So we need we need somewhere to go to that has a centralized way of angling, right? Best practices. So I really am looking forward to that, Hannah. Um, now you know, that's going to conclude our interview again. Thank you so much. But do you want to say anything, you know, be before we go? No, I mean, again, just thank you so much to the anglers for allowing us to, you know, get this, get this work done. And, you know, we are all working towards the same goal and want to see sustainable fisheries, um, for everybody now and in the future. You've been practicing that line, haven't you? No. Did it come oh. off good though? <laughs> it did come off good. good you right should now. use it more. Okay. I'll <laughs> Actually, write that down. One last question now, <clears throat> with enough time, right? With enough practice, with enough determination, okay? Will I eventually be able to choke out Dan? <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna not weigh in on that because I've seen the consequences when I do. So yes, I get beat I'm up and I get like almost killed. Oh, I mean, that's a lot of sand flying everywhere. That's when I like slowly back up and- <laughs> It's so fun though. Hannah, I really appreciate you being here. You guys like this video, subscribe to my channel if you haven't already and sit tight. We're going to try to go and do a live uh, question answer on land-based shark fishing. Hannah, again, I really appreciate you very much. Yeah. Appreciate you too, Travis.